All right, let's start the recording. All right. So here's how this is going to roll. This is our very first ever urgent CRM training, group training, uh, slash update call. Uh, we will be doing these every month. Be the, uh, would we agree, fourth Thursday of the month? Uh, you'll get an invite, as you should have, via text, email, et cetera. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll go over new things with Cogent and then at the end we'll do Q&A so you guys can all rapid fire questions and whatever. I think the benefit of an open Q&A is that you know you may be asking questions that someone else wouldn't ask and it kind of helps everybody understand you know what the challenges are for each other and uh, also helps us right better develop the product. So um, let me see if I can get this going okay. So we're going to talk about a couple things before Q&A. So we're going to talk about we've added the ability to upload files to forms, which I'll show you. Our web chat features, which uh, many of you are using, Kylie, the Davises and the Dickersons are using this. Um, email folders, not super relevant for everybody, but maybe useful to you if you're doing newsletters. And then how to build a referral system, because Richard James talked all about that at the last event. And so I wanted to show you a system that I've used for at least a year and have just recently integrated it with Cogent. And then we'll go into Q&A. Um, so now when you create forms, you have the ability to add an upload section. So if you want to in your web forms, and this is, what's that? Oh, I'm not? Oh, goodness. How am I not sharing my screen? Uh, Keep forgetting that you're the. You're challenging our ability, our memory ability, Robert. I totally am. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, is that the right screen? Okay, that's the right screen. Share. I'm not used to the Zoom thing. Oops, not that. There we go. All right, let's go backwards. There we go. Now you can see my cool slides, right? Um, you guys can see that? Yes. Okay, all right. So those are the, the things I just mentioned. Uh, you missed my POW because you didn't see my slide initially, but now you see the POW, right? Um, so now with forms, when you create a form in Cogent, you can now upload files. And so for some of our newer law firms, this is something I'm adding into their workflow. So not everybody is using our forms for you know, case management type operations, but if you wanted to collect something on the front end, of your lead capture, which may include a file, you could do that. So for example, we can append any form we create to an appointment set. So when you have the calendar integration and do appointment setting through Cogent, the second step could include stuff like upload this file or that file. Uh, this may or may not be relevant for your firm, but just know that you can do that. The way that shows up is if you were to go into the uh, sites area and look at forms and submissions, you can see, this is just a test example for you, where I upload an image. Um, you can also set the forms to only allow certain types of files. So maybe you don't want images, you just want Word documents or whatever, or PDFs, you can filter that as well. And then that gets appended to the contact record. So in the additional info space under your contact, you see here, I have this image that I uploaded from our most recent event of Allie and Melanie at the desk, but it could be a Word document or a PDF or whatever, and it would be attached to that contact record. So that's, that's kind of cool. Not everybody needs this, but just know that it's there. If you decide that you wanna you know, collect some sort of file data from someone, you can now do that. Um, web chat. Many of you already know about this. So our standard web chat comes with the CRM, right? It can be automated. Uh, I believe that we're doing the automation piece for uh, Kylie Matt Davis. I don't know that we're doing it for you, Catalina. I don't, I'm not sure if we're doing automated appointment setting. I don't think so because of your calendar stuff, but it can be done. Um, here's an example on our website of like the standard chat. So just a little bubble with a pop-up, ask me a question. Then you fill in your name, phone number, and email. The actual chat conversation happens via text message, and it shows up in the conversation section of Cogent. So the idea, of course, from the very beginning is that every conversation, whether it's Facebook or web chat or, or even a, a web form, 
shows up in the conversation section. So you have one place to go to see where your clients and prospects are talking to you. Uh, we added a new product called Cogent Chat that does a little bit more. Um, this is what it looks like inside Cogent. If you go into a contact record, in fact, I think this is yours, Kat. This is your thing. One of your folks. Yeah, DickersonLaw.com. So someone initiated a web chat and then there's a conversation in the conversation screen, but you can also see the entire history of where they came, what web page they went to, et cetera. This isn't demonstrated here, but one of the things that's really cool about this is if you're paying for advertising, it'll even show you in the activity screen Oh, this was a Google pay-per-click. And then they started a chat where this was a NOLO lead and they started a chat. So you can see the whole history of how did they initiate this contact. Um, for our enhanced chat, I, I like to call it enhanced chat. It's uh, cogentchat.com is the site if you want to check it out. Uh, if you're a current client, we're adding 25 bucks a month. It's flat fee. It's not a per chat basis, et cetera, because really... The main benefit of Cogent Chat is that it doesn't require our CRM if you don't have it. So that really gives us as a company an ability to acquire new clients to use the chat feature alone, but also it extends the capability. And for you, Catalina, I did, we didn't discuss this, but it can also do a WhatsApp button on there. So if they want to contact you via WhatsApp, we can add that to your site and they can do a WhatsApp or they can do a standard SMS chat or they can set an appointment, et cetera. Um, so this is, this is Kylie and Matt. So you'll see, you know, it's got a bubble. What you can't see right now, and you'll see it live on their site. If you go to Alabama Bank, Bankruptcy Relief, you'll see like his moving in that little bubble, like people are moving in there. And that really gets people's attention. Um, and then when you click it, it pops up with a video. Now you don't have to have a video. We have some generic ones we can provide for you as well. But the little boxes below Matt's face says chat with us, that's going to put them into the CRM, into the conversation section. The appointment one will go right to the calendar and allow them to self-schedule if they so desire. desire. Uh, we can add as many buttons as you like on here, but if you add too many, then Matt's face would be covered up, right? It'll just keep stacking until he's <laughs> under all the buttons. But like in your case, Catalina, you might want to add a WhatsApp button because a lot of your clients are cross-border, et cetera. And so we can talk about that later if you'd like. Uh, it has its own analytics and its own login. So you can go in there, you can modify those buttons yourself. You can look at stats. Um, you can see all these things separate. As I said before, this product platform was designed to be independent of the CRM, but also integrated. So you, if we have a client who uses something else, Four Eyes or Keep or whatever, they can still use this chat feature. Um, it keeps evolving. It keeps getting better. And as we have updates for you, we'll let you know. Same thing though. It'll record, if it's integrated with our CRM, it'll record how they came through. We get the same stats, same everything on the back end of the CRM. It's just a different front end interface that maybe is more appealing to your prospects and potential new clients. Uh, email folders. So this is new. So in the email marketing section of Cogent, you can do newsletters. I know many of you do this. We just add the ability to do folders. And so maybe your folder would be like all of your 2020 stuff or 2021 stuff, or you're going to separate your newsletters from your announcements or whatever. Before, it would just be a long laundry list of things, right? So you just click the folder icon, give it a name, and then you'll have a new folder up there. So you see the little gray folder there. And then you can just select one of the current newsletters, or when you create a new one, you can move them in. Um, side note, and maybe you don't know this, but see this st ugh, statistics icon on there. So you can look at stats, like how many opens you had, how many replies you had to a newsletter, et cetera. So you can look at those stats as well. So as we move forward and this thing grows, we want to make it easier to organize, right? Now, this is what I've been waiting to talk about is the referral program. So we've built out some referral stuff. In fact, I have a whole nother one I'm going to do later that we're still architecting that does direct mail out of the same system for referrals. Uh, you, in theory, you could do direct mail for anything out of the system, but it will be for referral in particular. So one of my discoveries in the last two years or so is something called um, Gift Goose. So if you don't, if you're not familiar with them, you could sign up. It's totally free to sign up. You put a credit card in there. 
And then what that allows you to do is select certain gifts. So you can pick your favorite gifts and then it gives you an email address that's specific to your account, right? And so all you have to do is, and, and we have a pre-built campaign. So if you wanna do this and you're interested in this, let me know, we can publish this campaign into your account. All you have to do is change the gift addresses to be specific to your Gift Goose account. And then it will go out to your clients or your referral sources or whatever. Um, it's not on the screen, but one that's super inexpensive and I typically send on my first referral is it's a little card with a, some chocolate inside and a note that says, thank you for the referral. And then, and there it is right there. And so it's got little bit of chocolate in there, a little card, super simple, but you're just acknowledging the fact that someone referred someone to you, right? And there's the note, you pre-program the note and all you have to do is send them via that email, send them the name of the person and their address and boom, that goes out with a note that you pre-built. And so in the system, what we do is you'll see, and this is inside the workflow section. Again, again, I can publish this into your account if you'd like, um, but you put the email address for the gift goose uh, product in there, right? And you'll notice it says contact name, contact full address right at the bottom. It just sends to that email address. The note on the previous screen, we pre-built. Thank you for your referral, Robert at Cogent Marketing. That's what's going to go on that card. And it just goes out. It's done. Like, no big deal, right? All you have to do is add a contact tag. So I've set it up where I have a contact tag called referral one. Because And the reason I'm doing that is I'm assuming that I might have five referrals from Catalina or Trisha or somebody, right? So I'm going to have referral one, referral two, referral three. So each time I get a referral, I might send them a different gift um, and a different note, but this is just the very simple versions of referral one plus a uh, sale one. So I assign that to a person. So I get a referral. I assign that to someone on my team. I add a note that we're, we're you know, uh, sending a referral gift. I send an internal notification. I wait a certain amount of time. And then I actually send it. You can't see it on the screen, but I send another email to, in this case, let's say Catalina. I say, hey, thank you for the referral. Did you get the gift I sent you? If you didn't let me know, I'd like to resend it. And so you're not only just sending the, the physical item, but you're sending, um, and you'll see in some different screenshots, voicemail drops like, hey, I, I, thanks for the referral, whatever, send them an email, et cetera. So we're hitting them multiple ways at the same time. And we're automating that. Um, and then the second step is referral sales. So let's say Catalina refers me Trisha. Trisha signs with me as a client. I mark her as a referral sale. Catalina now gets a second gift. Hey, guess what? Trisha signed with us. Thank you so much. Here's another cool thing. And it's like a box of cookies or whatever you want it to be. In fact, if I go back again, there's like all kinds of things you can do. And you can customize this. You can put your company logo on things or their company logo on things. It's really, really awesome. Um, so we tag it as referral sale. When I tag someone as a referral sale, same thing. We had a note to the contact. We had a task. You'll see here a task confirmation. So that actually assigns someone on my team to call and say, hey, thank you for the referral. And then I have yet another one that is a voicemail drop. It's my voice saying, hey, I just want to let you know that we got the referral. We got the sale from the person you sent over. Thank you so much. Let us know if there's anything we can do for you in, in exchange, whatever. Because you want to reinforce that positive activity, right? And so that's a lot of what Rich talked about at the event. But, you know, you have to admit, like you get you get distracted, you forget, whatever. So let's automate this stuff so we don't forget, so that we make sure the referral process is working and that we're thanking people for giving us business. All right. There's a Q&A time. So I know we had quite a few questions before we came on. Um, and I'll probably just bring up like the cogent interface for that piece. But um, let's let's free fire for a second. And then I'll take the pre-written questions after the fact. So does anybody have a question right now that they want to address either about what I presented or just in relationship to the product in general? Let me uh, change my sharing stuff. Zoom is not my favorite application, so. Um, can everybody self unmute or do you yeah, have more? Uh, you can unmute yourself if you have a question. No questions? Apparently not. All right. Is this screen I, sharing? Robert, I do is, have a, I, oh, go, go ahead, ahead. Go ahead. 
is Chris. Go ahead, Chris. Hey, I just had a question. I got into the call a few minutes late, but uh, did I heard somebody saying they use Nolo as well for leads. Is there a way of setting that up so that it automatically populates into Cogent? That's correct. Yeah, we can do that. You just have to um, uh, send me an email with your, with your uh, example of one of your NOLO leads, and then I'll give you a specific email address that you have to CC or BCC your leads to. That makes sense, right? So you carbon copy that, that email that you get from NOLO to mm -hmm. an email address I provide you, and then we will suck that right into Cogent. Okay, great. Because that, that would save me a little bit of time. I didn't realize you had that ability. That sounds good. Yeah, we do. And and it'll pre-populate into the opportunity screen as well. So, or, or really do whatever you want it to do. You just tell us and we'll, we'll take action based on that input. All right. Sounds good. I'll send you an email about that. Okay, perfect. I have a quick question for you. Uh-huh, sure. On the um, task when... Uh, you're assigning a task or assigning a task to yourself. Do you have something in the foreseeable future where you can set a um, an alert that will let you know that you're coming close to the end of that task being completed? Do you have? Uh, you mean like a deadline reminder? Like a deadline reminder that'll say, yeah. "Hey, you've got a task, and it needs your due date for the task is Monday, and it's Friday." Uh, how yeah, close absolutely, can do that today. So um, if you'd like us to set that up, we can do that for you. I'll just show you really quick how to do it in the workflows. So I can just go in here, set up a new workflow, and I can say, um, see here. task reminder, basically, uh -huh. right? And then I can say, you know, I can send a, a text, an email, I can send an internal notification. So all that stuff's possible. All you really have to do is tell us um what frequency so i typically i set up tasks with a reminder like three days before they're due and then maybe some period of time after they were due okay and chances are because you're working with attorneys you're trying to beat them about the head neck and shoulders remind them to get stuff done right so um more for me than him <laughs> <laughs> don't don't cover you don't have to cover for your attorneys we, we know that they're they're slack off they're just very busy people so, um, yeah, so it's totally possible today. Um, yeah, you can do that right inside the workflow section. In fact, I'll probably have at one point, I don't know that I'll do a separate like call like this on just workflows. What I'll likely do is a workflow training that I'll post on YouTube or something, because I don't know that everybody needs to spend a lot of time digging into workflows, but just know that anything you want to automate, we can do in here. In fact, um, just because I was working on this today for David Murphy, we were working on um, a client intake sheet workflow. And once the, the sheets, comp so the, the paralegal does one part, that's form one, the attorney does part two, which is form two. And then we send the intake form information based on the attorney's submission. So we have all these conditions. This is gonna look a little crazy, but like if the intake form includes business law, then we add the contact tag of business law, and then we send an email with a specific form link to the business law intake form to the client. If it's not business law, is it litigation? If it's not litigation, is it this? So we can do all these if then else scenarios, like if it's that, no, if it's this, that. So we can do a lot of cool things. The same thing can be done with tasks and, and things like that. So just know that workflows are super powerful but also confusing for a lot of people. So if you just want to send us an email and say, hey, I want this to happen when this happens, then we'll do that for you. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's pretty awesome. I'm, I'm new, so a lot of this is new to me. So. Fair enough, fair enough. Next on the, next up to bat. Robert, I have a question. Um, I am... I've been waiting for the day for my um, HTML builder, my broadcast to be switching over. And I guess today's the day. So I went over there and so the email I, builder versus HTML. Yeah. 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 So I, I clicked on it and I do see it. However, half of the page or half of the screen is in um, code. 
Okay. And which I don't really know. And then the other half is my actual thing. I want to edit it in like HTML and not in code. So how can I edit that way? Is it in settings? Uh, so I don't totally understand the question. So you're used to using the HTML builder. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And right. you want to use the new email builder? I don't have a choice now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. but you, you want, you do want to edit in code or you don't? I don't want to edit in code. Like I just did it right now because I'm going to have to make uh, the Dickerson little newsletter. Yeah. And I got into it because it says, you know, do you want to, you know, I go to HTML builder. It's not there anymore. So switch right. the, to the new email builder. I'm going there now. Yep. And then I, I go and open it up and then it, it does open it up. But half of the screen is like the whole page, but it's in code. And then the other half of the screen is my actual, um, what I'm used to seeing, right? I'm yeah. building it in blocks, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so how we, can we I- We might have to re, we might have to rebuild it because of the import process from the old to the new, some of that stuff got messed up. So okay. Kat, just- uh, let, me show, here, let me show you. Shoot me an email and we can change that for you. Oh. That's what it looks like right now, see? Okay. The, yeah, we don't want code. that. And then this is the, the thing and I can't, I can't edit it. It just does that. There's yeah. Yeah, that's part of the, the, the transition process is a little clunky. So just shoot uh, Allie and I an email and we'll go in there and fix it for you. And then you won't have to deal with it. Okay. Thank you. No problem. And then one, one more thing. Sorry, I'm going to ask one more question. I love the referral options. Yes. I, I did create a funnel. Um, for uh, sharejmd.com okay. is the landing page. And that's going to be our landing page for referrals. And I created um, like triggers to notify Tanya that a referral come in. I just, I just changed it to Tanya today. And I, and Raquel is on our team also. And she's, she's the one who sends out the thank you notes. Um, we've got the landing page built up, but maybe we can um, add some of that, that gift features uh, to, to the rest of it. Yeah, absolutely. So I think like, so what I demonstrated for you is a very basic referral program, automated referral program where we send out gifts. Uh, if you're sending letters, we'll also have a way to automate that as well. So you literally don't have to do anything. If you share with us either through a conference call, your process or, you know, a Word document with a workflow and we want this to happen and this to happen and this to happen, we can just build it out for you. So this might just be one of those scenarios where we need to spend an hour on the uh, a call, go through the workflow process for your referrals, and then maybe go through your newsletter stuff and just wipe it all out, fix it all okay. in one day. Yeah. Is anybody here sending direct mail that you think you could automate or would prefer to automate? I'm Really it, so here's the thing, like with direct mail stuff, which we're gonna add in here as a feature is, or can I interject? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so the big focus for what we're doing here in this practice is I'm in the process of designing a direct mail program. Um, first of all, the big challenge is, is collecting the data. Right. So, you know, we've literally got to go down to the courthouse and, you know, and, 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 and cattle prod a, a dungeon keeper to let us in and you know go and get <laughs> files and look through them and get addresses and then try and figure out who we're going to send it to it i don't actually have an e a, a, a mail piece yet okay uh, so so but i'm wondering how we are going to use our crm to manage our direct mail that's a that's the question jackal wants to know well, he's going to show right oh, he's now. He's going to show right now. Well, no, I'm, I'm not going to show direct mail at the moment, but I can oh. tell you what I would probably do if I were in your shoes. It would depend largely on the volume of direct mail you send and or the cost to have someone manually do it. Uh, the number one challenge always is to get the list. Mm -hmm. uh, but in a perfect world, you could load the list into Cogent, right? Hit a button that says these guys are all direct mail and it just sends them a mail piece that's pre-built in the system, right? And the call to action could be whatever you want. It could be a phone number, which we can generate in the system, which would be trackable, but it could also be a landing page or a URL that may or may not be part of the website, right? So 
I think it's uh, Charles Lapuka has one like separate from his website. It's called like padebt.com. And so in his direct mail pieces, he sends that uh, website address, which is really just a landing page and then a separate trackable phone number. So he knows anybody responds to direct mail piece. He's got phone tracking and then he's got website tracking that's separate from his main site. And so that becomes important when you start spending any kind of significant money on direct mail, because you really want to know, am I getting an ROI? Am I getting appointments out of this? That kind of thing. And so um, I'm a techie and I'm kind of lazy when it comes to stuff like that. I'd prefer to automate the whole thing. But when you automate everything, there tends to be a higher cost because the automation services, when it comes to direct mail, are going to charge some sort of premium for postage and printing and blah, blah, blah. So it usually is a good choice when you're doing onesie twosie things. Um, and maybe as you're doing higher volume, it's when you want to go through, through a mail house or print, print shop. But anyway, the short answer is you can do it all here. Go ahead. Hi, Karina. Sorry, I Hi, how are you, Robert? Um, I don't understand how fulfillment works with direct mail through Cogent. Like, so there's like there's probably uh, half a dozen different services we can plug into. I'm gonna, I'm actually, I've done, I've used it before, and I'm gonna set up my demonstration through something called Click to Mail. So it's click the number two and then mail.com. Uh, you can send eight and a half by 11 letters. You can send postcards. You can send handwritten notes. You can send all kinds of crazy stuff. You're, uh, as with most mailing services, they discount based on volume. So depending on how many you send, um, essentially what would happen is you load your list in, into Cogent, right? You mark them with a tag that calls, you know, direct mail, uh, you know, in your case, because you're a bankruptcy, it'd be like direct mail, lien letter, direct mail, this letter, direct mail, that letter, right? Foreclosure or whatever. You can tag them a certain way. And then the system can automatically push the recipient data and the template letter, for lack of a better description, a mail merge, right? That puts their name, address and stuff in there. And maybe their debt amounts or whatever data you have, and then sends that out through that service automatically. Um, so we can fully automate that. The question is, does the cost uh, meet your current requirements? So here's another question though. Can I direct it to a specific fulfillment location and just use Cogent for the tracking? So for example, I have an FDCPA campaign that we're starting uh -huh. and I'm going to be sending a letter to each um, chapter seven, debtor as soon as their case closes, okay? And two weeks after that, we're going to send them another letter. Okay. And then one month after that, they're going to get a third letter. Okay. So that within the first 60 days of their case closing, they will get three letters from us. However, if they respond to the first letter, I don't want them to get the second and third letter. Okay. That's so, entirely possible. Yes, we could do that. The question is, what does your fulfillment center need in terms of information? Are they expecting like an Excel spreadsheet or what do they want to see? So we use 3D mail um, and I usually just send them an Excel spreadsheet. Um, okay. And Tara is really good about, you know, cleaning it up and making sure I don't have duplicates and making sure that my zip codes are five digits, not four and all those kind of lovely things. Right. Um, but I usually just like I do um, just, you know, put everything onto an Excel spreadsheet and email her the spreadsheet. That's what so I what, doing. So, the, so the second question to that then is what's the call to action? Is it a call or is it a web address or is it both? On the current mailer, it's a call. OK. And we're a, so in the scenario where they call. Based on the direct mail letter they received and we use a tracking number in Cogent. Assuming they call from a number that's associated with the contact, we could automatically take them out of the correspondence. So they would no longer get the other letters. Mm -hmm. If they don't automatically call from that number, someone on your team has to look them up and make sure that they mark them as having you know, responded to the correspondence. If they went to a web address that we put on the letter and we put the tracking information from Cogent on there and they clicked onto the website and they did something that you wanted them to do, like fill out a form or whatever, same thing. We could take them out of the correspondence, so they would no longer get those 
they would no longer be shipped those uh, addresses to send you know, letter number two or three or four. So the answer is yes, with some minor exceptions, right? Okay. Well, yes, but we're still going to have to inspect what we expect. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yes or yes. <laughs> I know where I am. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yeah, we can do that. So all these scenarios that that um, you're bringing up and that others are bringing up, we can do them. Is it a hundred percent? Never. Like not with any system. But is it ninety percent? Yeah. And we'll get ninety percent there. Like you only have ten percent that you have to inspect, so to speak. That's awesome. That's very exciting. Thank you. Cool. You're welcome. Other questions? Ali, will you bring up the questions from Christine's? Uh, is Tracy on here? Tracy, yes, Tracy's on here. We're waiting for our questions to be answered. <laughs> Patiently waiting. <laughs> Try not to ask too many questions. Yeah, ask as many as you'd like. Well, we can start at the beginning. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, she's trying to find them right now. I know one of, I know one of her questions was when someone calls, why do they show up as an opportunity? And the reason is, do you mind if Christine, do you mind if I bring up your, uh, cogent screen here? Sure. You can share with the class. Okay. So one of the the questions that Tracy asked was, why do opportunities show up when it's just a phone call? Well, we have, um, in your case, when someone calls your direct mail number, like this one probably, we have an automation trigger that says, right here, call tracking. If they call from the website, we don't create an opportunity. We just tag them as a website phone call, right? Um, if they call from direct mail, then we create an opportunity because that's where you are getting, you know, cold leads from. So when we get a direct mail phone call, we have a specific tracking number in there. Then we create a, an opportunity. Well, I actually deleted it because she said she didn't want it, but the, uh, you know, we can either, not or can do add an opportunity when someone calls that number. I think what maybe was happening is that you had a direct mail opportunity. They called in and they kept calling that same phone number and that kept creating new opportunities every time. So instead of doing that, we'll just mark them as direct mail, new lead in here. And then you guys will create the opportunity when they call in. Is that acceptable or do you want to automatically create the opportunities? That maybe is a question for Tracy, not you. I don't know. Um, am I am I unmuted? Yeah. You're unmuted. Yes. Okay. No, that's fine for you to do it. But I thought I had noticed, like, when some because I have my own direct line. Right. And I thought it was just with current clients. There was a couple of times where our current clients came in under qualified lead, and so I know they weren't calling a number off of a letter. Yeah, so it, it's in, it's well, you know, I don't know how they did that, but the way we have it set up, it should only be for direct mail. So I had this right here, where if they call on this number, the direct mail phone number, it creates them as a new lead and then a qualified lead. Um, in our, at least in, in my uh, mind, a new lead is just someone who inquired, but maybe you didn't have communication with. A qualified lead is someone who inquired, but you also had communication with. So direct mail means I sent them a letter, then they also called back. That's qualified, right? Because they responded. And so that's why we set them at, as such. If it's a real problem for you, we can do some workarounds, but I would, I would suggest that we keep all direct mail as opportunities on the opportunity screen. Um, and you're that's welcome fine. to disagree with me. That's fine. Okay. Robert wins. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. Yeah. So I think, I think that unless it becomes a serious issue and the only time I've really seen that be a problem is like if that phone number is getting a bunch of spam calls and all of a sudden we're getting a bunch of opportunities created based on a phone call and none of them are actually clients, that's kind of a problem. But in this case, we have it set up where it's an incoming call. The call status is completed. In other words, you spoke to them and then hung up 
and the source was direct mail, then we create a qualified lead in the pipeline. So, uh, do you have Tracy's other questions up there, Alan? Can the frequency of automated SMS be changed? Oh yeah, so one of your questions was, can the frequency of automated SMS be changed? So can you help me, Tracy, with what the thought process was there? We scheduled an appointment and Sarah sent them two messages about their appointment within 30 minutes. So I just noticed a lot of times that she's kind of burdensome. She's sending a lot of text messages. She's uh, uh, Sarah is so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> she's a, what she's, what's Rich say? She's a buy, die, or go away kind of person. So yeah, we can change that. The, the appointment reminder is setting in the campaign. So right now we have, uh, when someone books an appointment, they get an email immediately. And then here's where your issue might be, is if they book an appointment in less than 24 hours or just on the edge, that's where that'll happen. So right now we send an email 24 hours before. That's what this negative is. I don't know if you can see the screen. Negative 24. So 24 hours before the appointment, we send an email and a text. And then four hours before the appointment, we send an email. And two hours before the appointment, we send an SMS. So if they book, let's say, 26 hours before their actual appointment, they are going to get harassed. Now, if you see some exception to that, um, shoot me an email with the name of the person, and I can just go into the conversation section and see who it is and see if there's some sort of flaw or something, and we can modify that. Okay, let me see if I can find my cheat sheet, because, yeah, there was two of them, but I'll let yeah, you know. Send so yeah, so Tracy, send me the email, an email with the names of those two people, and then I'll look at them and see if there's some sort of issue, like a configuration problem or whatever. Okay, great. Thank you. What was the last question, Ellie? Can our phone number be included? Can your phone number be included in what? Because a lot of times I've, I've noticed that Sarah's sending out SMSs saying, hey, can I help you get back in touch contact us yep and i think that's coming from the it's coming from sorry. the system yep yes yeah, from the um i think like the no hire column yeah and so she's like hitting them up saying give us a call but is there a number i wasn't sure like what number are they be given to call well, because the, in that message that i see there's not a number uh there should be there maybe there's not because it's not assigned as current assigned to christine so I'll make sure that there's a number in there. So normally what's supposed to happen is the number she says to call is a number she's texting from, right? So it should be like, call me at this number. And that number just forwards to your office. So okay. the reason I like to do it that way is because I want to see, I want to track in the reporting and the call reporting over here. I want to be able to see like of the campaigns and sources that we have. I want to see that if they call back or text back on that number, um, you know, what the entire conversation is. If I tell them to call your office line directly, that's great. We can do that. But then we lose I'm our track. I'm not seeing a number, period. I'm okay. not seeing a number, period. Yeah, so send me a sample of that because that might be a bug or something that we have to I fix. Should. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I think Robert Tracy is suggesting that you put something in the body of the text message, but I understand it to be that the message that she's texting from is a good phone number they can call back, which will reach us. Correct. And that okay. phone number will provide tracking in the cogent system. That's correct. Both statements are okay. correct. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. You got to learn to speak, Tracy Bell. Hey, I'm I'm learning right now. Um, I, so those I think those are the three questions you asked. Again, if anything falls outside the scope of this conversation today and you need more help, please just email us and we'll set up a separate call to you know, dive into your specific needs. Um, but we're still here. So any other questions at the moment? Okay. Um, Jeff, uh, prospective new lead, Jacqueline? <laughs> um, Sam. Okay, just get rid of them. All right, so um, assuming that Uh, okay, so I think what Jacqueline was asking when we were muted earlier uh, was, you know, so when we have a when we have a client, so you know who hires us, 
and we have this hiring relation that they're they were serving them then generally to you to, to give them some kind of identifier we generally use a case number okay sure. and typically clients who um hire us we generally end up either defending them in some kind of case or filing some kind of bankruptcy case or being involved in some kind of litigation or something like that occasionally uh people who don't you know, say, say somebody comes in for wills, durable powers attorney or, or, or something like that, there isn't a case that gets generated. And so what I might use as a matter ID might just be the date that they came in and their name or something like that. Okay. Um, but Jacqueline's saying, well, should we track that information in the CRM? And my answer to her question is, I don't know. So um, so I'm putting that out to you. Yeah, I, I'd almost defer that back to the group uh, for the other attorneys, but I would I would be inclined to say that unless you're using Cogent for some sort of case management, I wouldn't. That's um, kind of what my thinking is because we use something different for case management than Cogent. Yeah. Now at some point, you know, ideally, you know, they they always they kind of sit there. Someday you'll have QuickBooks Online and you'll have Clio or Practice Panther and you'll have Cogent and they'll all work together seamlessly, you know. Um, that'll never happen, by the way. But yeah, yeah okay. Ahead. You know, well, then, <laughs> then I'm okay doing what we're doing now using a, you know, 20 year old version of Amika's attorney. Yeah. So, yeah, I would say, I mean, maybe Catalina could pipe in here because I know they use Cogent a little bit for like case workflow stuff. So Kat, can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. We use it. We use the pipelines for uh, different um, basically lines of business. So we have a pipeline for estate planning, a pipeline for probate and uh, so on. And so what we do is we create the stages of the case and uh, either it's for internally organizing ourselves um, and we go through it and or some of them have actual copy, like trigger language. And so when they're in the hire, there's, uh, you know, when you get populated in there, uh, thanks for hiring our firm and, you know, expect to call blah, blah, blah. And then it, if, the, if the case moves over, then we move them over. But I don't, we don't really keep track to your question, you know, answer your question. We don't keep matter numbers in cogent because um we're just going to find them by tags and we're just going to tag them as such and, you know what what they might be coming in for or um when we send out our weekly broadcast we tag them email newsletter um if they're a chamber member we you know tag them chamber member and so on and so forth so i i haven't and Mike hasn't seen a need to put any matter information in Cogent and just keep it in Practice Panther. Yeah, and that that would be my advice too. Just keep all of the matter management, like the actual case management in your case management software. Um, doesn't mean we can't potentially exchange information with, between the two, but I think it just gets too confusing. Like the fundamental uh, concept behind cogent CRM or really any CRM keep or, or Clio grow or whatever, is that this is where you put your potential new clients and we nurture them. We get them set appointments, right. And we do all the pre sales type stuff. Then once they become a client and they've signed their engagement letter or whatever your process is, then they move into a matter and they're in your case management software. So it's a little more confusing for someone like yourself, Patrick, where you're like, and, and Kathleen's the same way where they could be the same client they move back and forth, right? From current matter to new K to new potential, whatever, right? Now, oh, okay, I, I, uh, I did a business formation with you, but now I need a trust, right? So now they're back in the pipeline for a potential new deal. And it's important that they're in the CRM because you could still lose that deal. They could do their trust with some other attorney, right? They don't have to use you just because they formed their business with you. So I think it's important to move them back into the sales process and track them that way not only for your PCLC and, you know, uh, sales tracking stuff, but also just making sure that they're going through the workflows that we build out so that, you know, no one's dropping the ball. Um, but, but yeah, I think the real answer is for case management, case identification, that kind of thing, use case management software. Does that help Patrick? He must be muted or something. He nodded. Oh, he nodded. I couldn't see his face because my screen's like. 
I didn't expect that many people to be here, which I'm really excited that you guys are here. Like, geez. Robert, I think we have a question and, and I, uh, Tanya on my team had brought it up and we're trying to figure this out. Uh, I don't know, Tanya, if you want to bring up how we can, um, we know that Cogent, how we start with our contacts and Cogent because it's usually the big funnel, the leads come in. And right. then we do, we have set up triggers to push that con, uh, the Zapier into Practice Panther, the contact information, including their, their address and all of that. We've noticed that though, when sometimes when it pushes, it gives the office address. It doesn't capture the address that we've entered in. That's one thing. For the person? And then two, yeah, that it's the right person, but it just puts our work, our office address. Okay. And, um, and secondarily, like if we want, if, how, how can we maybe do like a, a periodic push, you know, and systematize that, automate, automate that push of the cogent contacts coming in and going into Practice Panther and correctly with address and everything. So I'll have to, the, the address issue might just be a function of how it's programmed currently. So I'd have to look at how it's set up. But the periodic push question is really, so as with most softwares, it needs some reason to send them over. So we need a trigger of some kind that, you know, either tag them of update contact and then the, that tags tells Zapier or Cogent to push the stuff over. So you would need to tell me when you would want that periodic update to happen and what's the trigger, what's the key inflection point that says, hey, we have to do this right now. So we have to decide on when that, you know, what's going to make that happen. So you just tell me how you'd like that update to happen and we can make it happen. As far as the address is concerned, I'll just look at the zap and make sure that it's, there's nothing broken there that we're maybe, maybe those fields aren't populated or something. So it's just pushing default data or something. Right. And maybe we can um, do, you know, uh, Tanya, maybe we can work on the ones like chronologically, the ones that maybe we see that haven't pushed over and do a bull push. But I would imagine that in the set stage would be a good time to make sure we have all of the Practice Panther contact information, correct? Definitely. I think during the set is the most important because um, before that, they're just leads. I haven't collected as much information or they haven't set just yet. Um, but once I set them, then that's when I'm finding myself having to make sure I take all the information that, that's already there, if it's not collected already, and try, trying to match it onto um, the Practice Panther contact. Um, because then the issue we run into is that the, their information is not updated and they need to send out engagement letters. So the, the real issue is that they have changed their address or their phone number or their name or something, right? Is that what you not mean? Not necessarily. When we create, when we, okay, so um, we use the tag new lead to create the contact from Cogent uh, and push it into Practice Panther and create a new contact that way. So right. once I put the, that tag, um, it, it creates the contact with just the name, the email address, and it populates our physical address. So what we would like to do is, if possible, all the fields that are um, that are filled in to transfer them over, or um, at the very least have the phone number as well as the email address and the physical address. Um, if they have a company name, great, but they don't always have company names. Um, but just having at the very least the phone number and the address on there would help tremendously in, in just making sure all the contacts are up to date. Okay. Yeah, that's not a problem. I think we can we can work on that for you. Because so I, I mean think... essentially we're using we are we do use a, a trigger system and when she puts in the tag new lead, it does that. But sometimes what happens is um well I don't know that maybe they're an existing client and they're not necessarily a new lead, but maybe we just didn't have, we realized we didn't have their address or maybe this time is a new address. So maybe we can, we can set that for uh, a time where we can, we can uh, kind of make sure that we've got that right on our end. Yeah, I think, I think that the answer is yes, we can do that. I think that, you know, because we have a couple different things we need to work on together, we should just set up a call and just go through them all. Yeah, for sure. We can fix that. Robert, may I ask you a question? Of course. Um, so, you know, as we are identifying prospective clients or prospects 
and let's say that I'm, I'm, I'm dragging this out of the dungeon of the courthouse and bringing it over. Do we enter those addresses in as new leads? Um, I, yeah, I, I, well, it depends on the volume, right? So I probably would, in your scenario, you're talking about direct mail candidates, right? We're going to pull those people in and send right. them a letter. Yeah. Yeah. So I probably wouldn't put them as new leads. I put them in as contacts and I would tag them as direct mail. Okay. And then when they respond in some fashion, then, then I'd throw them in the opportunities. Yeah. I see okay. Trisha nodding her head. She's got, she, she already knows what she wants to do in this scenario. <laughs> Trisha, you want to say something here? Is this a process you're familiar with? No, she's like, no. Uh, no, I, I, that's something that Joe and I oh, talked about, Trisha. Irene, is, hi, um, is exactly that, taking the list each day that we're mailing to and shoving it into the, uh, I don't, the CRM. CRM, yeah. And that way then when someone calls in, instead of what I currently do is a mishmash of reinventing the wheel eight different times to make sure we're marking them as, as a lead here and marking them as a lead there. And like, it's, it's a nightmare. And so making it, so the CRM is the one place where all of that happens. So the list exists already in the CRM as contacts. And then when they raise their hand, um, when they call in, we would just search in the CRM because they in theory already exist. And we wouldn't have to then enter all that data in. They've already given it. Well, we already have some of it. Um, and then you mark them as a lead and start moving them through those different pipelines. Yeah, and if I can add to that, so if they're already in the system, and I'm going to use uh, Christine's account as a. Oh, I stopped sharing your screen. You stopped sharing my screen? How dare you? Can I share it back again? Or do you stop me from having yeah, the. You can do it again. Here's the problem though, is I'm an idiot when it comes to the stupid Zoom stuff. Um, well, what I was gonna do is, because I can't figure out how to share my screen now. What I was gonna say is like, if you're in the opportunity screen, there's that green button. She's gonna help me now, so I'm incapable. I gotta do it there, okay. What is this? Where the, why is it not here? Why is yours funny? I don't know. The same reason I show up as, as you. You broke it, Robert. No. Do, that one. Screen one. That one. There we go. Okay. Yeah, I did break it. Um, what I was trying to say is this. So if they're already in your database, right, to your point, they call in you're on the opportunity screen you hit new right they're not they're not currently an opportunity but if you hit new you can type their name in like robert they're going to show up right in a drop down menu boom you hit that and they're going to populate oh, if i do it right there it goes they're going to populate the data and then all you have to do is put the opportunity name and and source and whatever and then you're done right so uh, that's what I would do. I'd load them in the database. So they're in here. So if you search for them, you can just find them automatically and they get pre-populated. And if they, if you're asking the questions the right way, you know, and who referred you to our firm and they say, oh, I got a letter, then you know, right away, oh, they're going to be in the database if we've been mm -hmm. uploading them in. And so then you, you're- Yeah, and in theory, Trisha, they would have like, they out. would have a tag probably because when we load them in, we're going to have like direct mail tag or something mm -hmm. already on there. And so we would pull up Robert and we'd see this tag would show up already. And if you really want to be silly about it, it could be like direct mail foreclosure, direct mail lien, right. direct mail, whatever, right? So However I type granular in, you wanted to get. Yeah. So I type Robert's name in here and I see the tags. I'm like, oh, you, you came through direct mail on a foreclosure or whatever. And that can um, just inform your call person, your intake person as to how to keep going on that intake. Right. There's yeah. a different process based on the different letter that they received. Yeah, and you could, if you really wanted to get silly, you could also import them with notes so you could have like specific details in here. But I think from an efficiency perspective, I would just use tags, you know, so be like direct mail, foreclosure, lien, whatever it is. Um, and then you can just see that right there on that screen. Uh, want to clarify something for my staff that's listening. I, I think we would put 
as the source direct mail. And you could throw the tag direct mail and then each of the different granular aspects of direct mail into tags too. But the lead yeah, so, source, I think you'd want to be direct mail, right? Yeah. So this is, this is a, um, my personal belief is that the source information should be a, a 30,000 foot, right? So direct mail is your source. It's not direct mail foreclosure. That's not your source. Your source is direct mail. Your tag could be direct mail foreclosure. And, and the reason you want to do that is because your lead source ROI, your dashboard stuff is going to be really messy. Let me change this to last year real quick. Because your sources should be like this. It should be like Facebook, Google, referral, website, direct mail. It shouldn't be like Google, uh, you know, page five of the website. And your referral shouldn't be like, Johnny Miller from East Idaho. It should just be referral. And then your tags should designate those details because otherwise you're going to have like 8,000 of these lead sources in here. Right. And it's going to be super confusing. So keep your lead sources super high level on the opportunity screen. And that's going to make things so much easier for you. Cause like you're going to be able to look in here and do a report that says, okay, you know, 50% of our wins came from direct mail. And you'd see that right here on the screen, right? Now, if you really want to break it down further than that, then you go into your contacts and then you can do a report on direct mail lead sources and then tags, right? Um, if you have very messy lead sources and you want to clean it up, what's the best way to do that? Like you were, do you just had a thing up that said like lead source report or something? Can you go into yeah, that that's, report? So, that's, and then so this is pulled directly from your opportunity screen. So let me change the date again last year. So this comes from your opportunity screen, right? So if you, if you have people putting in opportunities and every single time they put in a lead source, maybe like, and this is a common one. I put Facebook, but I misspell it. I put be okay, for example, Facebook, right? Now you're going to have Facebook and Facebook in there. The easiest way to fix this at the moment is for me to just download this whole thing into an Excel sheet, fix the sources, and then re-upload them with updating the data. And if you need help with that, we can do that for you. I mean, I know that Karina, that you guys are a little bit newer to the system. So if we want to fix like some typos or some errors there, then we can just download the list fix them all, re-upload them and update the data. And then it'll, it'll present on the screen properly. Yeah, most definitely. Robert, yeah. I do have a question. Yes. Um, in regards to um, duplicate opportunities, we have, we have a, an issue sometimes where if, if in case there's already an existing opportunity and I get, I, I, I understand the need for having to have multiple opportunities, but if we need, if we have like, for example, an, an opportunity for um, a, a set and um, then we accidentally move them on the pipeline and it duplicates, it, it, it sends another one. Um, is there a way to prevent that from happening? There's no way to prevent it at the moment. Um, if you have duplicates, so so here's the thing. So you have, and you guys need duplicates because you have multiple pipelines. So this isn't necessarily an answer for you, but just for the, the sake of the group, if you go into settings, um, there's a, in the settings screen, there's an allow duplicate opportunities and allow duplicate contacts option. Um, I typically don't allow duplicate opportunities unless you have multiple pipelines because it, it could be an opportunity in one pipeline and an opportunity in another pipeline. Now, if it moves into the wrong spot or whatever, you're going to have to either move it back or just delete it. Like you can delete opportunities. Unfortunately, there's no automatic way to do that at the moment. But like if Bob test over here was a duplicate, I just go here and delete them. Right. Or I'd move him to the right, right area. So I can change his pipeline to onboarding and change his stage to, you know, kick ass call or whatever and you know and just change them around there or just delete them if it's just totally wrong does that answer your question tanya or catalina catalina so <laughs> and i and i i was wondering too because tanya had brought up uh we had a somebody you know working fast there was another paralegal and they were entering in an opportunity and it let them enter in the opportunity 
uh, but um, they they uh, they didn't have they weren't a contact yet in CRM in in right. Cogent. Okay. So it it is there a way to uh, have the opportunity not a, be allowed to be created unless there's a contact associated with that opportunity? No, because a lot of the reason is is because a lot of times we, that's when we first get the contact, right? So they call my office. They're not in my system. I I typically recommend hit the new opportunity screen and put their information in there. As soon as you put them in here, then they're a contact, but they're also an opportunity. Um, if you want them to be an a contact first, we have this quick add contact thing that you can use. Um, or you can go to the contact screen and do that. But I, I, I don't understand the business case though. Like, why do you want them to be in a, a contact first, Kat? Robert, I think I have, we're, we were muted and we're having, Jacqueline and I are having a discussion about that. And she's going, oh, she's asking the same question. I'm just asking you. Okay, good. And <clears throat> what, what it is, is, is that, is that obviously if we get somebody who's never contacted the firm before, you know, then they come in and you create a new opportunity and then they become a member of the contact list, right? Right. Okay. But we, we have, you know, old, uh, old intake sheets. We have all the stuff that's from the, the CRM that we're putting into a list that we are going to eventually upload into Cogent. Okay. And the I and when I says Jacqueline, if that person calls with a new matter, then you type their name in, and then it populates up the data that we have on them before, and they're in a separate list as contacts. They're not necessarily opportunities. Is that correct? Yeah. So exactly. So if you upload a list, they're not going to be an opportunity. They're only going to be an opportunity if you take either a brand new contact and add them as an opportunity or an old contact and create an opportunity, right? So in this, this quick ad screen, you can, you can add a contact without creating an opportunity. That's not a problem. Um, right. You can easily do that. Uh, it's just a question of, it, it really comes down to like workflow. Like what do you, what do you want to have happen? So, so what, in, in, in our case, in our, in our case specifically, we don't start off the first thing opportunity. We create the opportunities um, or, or sometimes we'll automate them, but the first thing is the contact. So um, the, once the contact gets created and, and that's when we collect all the information, that's, I, I don't, um, we don't go, we don't stay on the opportunities. Um, I'm the one that, that keeps them updated. Um, however, the paralegals, they don't, they don't touch the contacts. All they do is that they move things in, or add opportunities into their specific pipeline. Okay. What I'm trying to regulate is that when they're creating opportunities into their pipeline, um, it doesn't give them the, the option to, or I think it does, but they're not filling in the option for the information, like the phone number, the email. They're just typing in the name and then creating the opportunity. If the name doesn't match with a specific client or with a specific uh, contact that's already there, what I'm trying to do is to stop that opportunity from being created. So if I can input, so what, what if you've got two different people entering the same person, but maybe the name is spelled incorrectly, they're off by one letter and it doesn't recognize it. So then they create a whole new contact. So now you have duplicates. It's the same person, but a little bit confusing. Is that what you're saying? Well, the duplicates I'm able to work through because if it's a duplicate, if I see the new contact created, because um, what it'll do is it, it'll it'll create them as a new contact, but it'll only have their name on there. So I'm able to fix those duplicates by searching for the correct person and just merging them. But then there's cases where that contact it's it's a it's a completely new contact. It's a completely new lead. They didn't come through us or they're old old contacts on Practice Panther, not yet having had been imported to Cogent. So we do have some of their information, but it's just not in Cogent. And so we want to kind of make a little, you know, a, a pop up or something say there's nobody here. There's no one by that name. Create a contact first. And that way it'll it'll alert them or they can tell me, hey, create this contact and I'll input the information. Then they can go ahead and start with the opportunity. Is that is that something that's possible? Like a flag, like a red flag that says stop 
before you do this? Yeah, something like that. Something just to, to um, let them know they're about to create a new contact rather than using an existing contact. Yeah, so I've got two options for you there. Not exactly what you want, but here's, here's the way I, I would address that. <clears throat> One, if you create an opportunity and I start typing a name in and it doesn't come up, then they're a new contact, period, right? Okay. Um, if you want to create a contact without creating an opportunity, you can do this lightning dashboard thing. Uh, your other option is, is that we can create like an intake sheet, like in the case of Murphy. So we created a sheet like this. I find it here. We actually created a web address for him for these. So like his client intake sheet, number one here, you could create, or we could create a form. Let me uh, bring it up another screen. We could create a form that asks additional, additional questions, right? What, what this doesn't do though, because it's an input form, it doesn't bring up if they already exist in the database, right? What it does do is it gives you the ability to ask additional questions like case type, matter, whatever, put notes. So this might be more of your new prospect intake form. Like if you're using Lex reception or something, maybe we create a form like this and they put it in here, right? Then they, you know that the person's in the system before your paralegal sets the opportunity, something like that. Um, otherwise, back to what I said, like your, your options are really to do the quick contact thing or just educate them or I can educate them on the fact that when they're out in the opportunity screen, if a name doesn't come up, then they're essentially adding a new contact, right? Because if I add in, if I add Rob, Robert comes up, but if I add uh, Larry, there's no Larry that comes up, right? So it doesn't pop up. It doesn't pre-populate. So that person does not exist in the database. Um, so that, that just might be an education thing. I mean, you guys tell me. That's probably what it's going to be. And it's just, it's so far and few between, but it just, it just happened to come up when you were sending like, oh, send questions. So like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, back. totally. And I, you know, and I, but you know, here's it's the more thing. more of an education thing. Yeah. yeah. I, and that's the thing, like, right. Like software can't do everything for us. Yeah. God, I wish it could like pay my bills and mow my lawn. But the, the, uh, the reality is, is that there's always going to be some element of human error or human education required to avoid the error. And so to the extent that we can automate and avoid that, we will. But, you know, some of this stuff is always going to fall back on our team. All right, Pat, you're in deep Robert, thought over I, there. So may oh. I ask? This yes. is the hi. This is a simple question, I think. Sure. So, in, op in opening an opportunity, you you said a few minutes ago the source box you would use as the thirty thousand foot level. Yes, sir. For example, a web lead, a referral. Um, Correct. Okay, so if I want to keep track of people that are referring me cases, I've been putting that in the tag either their name or the name of the firm, and then in the source, putting a referral. Is that going to let me figure out who to be most grateful to? Yeah, absolutely. So you're doing it correctly. So I'd put source referral, and then in the tag, I'd put Robert Stanley, because he's your number one referral source, right? Right. So Robert Stanley is the referral source, and the source is referral. I hit update, right? So now I know Robert referred this to me. If I wanted to, you know, at the end of the year, send Christmas gifts based on number of referrals. So like, I'm going to send Doug a Ferrari because he sent me a hundred referrals. And then I'm going to go into my contacts, right? And there's a filter section here and we can filter based on source. Okay. Right. So I'm going to filter on source and then my source is referral. Right. It's going to show me here, my referrals. Right. And then I can see my two tags are Robert Stanley. But if you had hundreds of them, you can also filter on tags or you can just download this list of the of all your referrals and the tags will show up. Right. And so you'd have an Excel sheet that says, hey, you know, I've got 10 referrals from Robert and two from Karina and 10 from Kylie or whatever. And you can sort through it that way. Wonderful. Does that, does that answer your okay. question? 
it that's also a situation it. where you're going to want to be careful about how people are entering the, in those names. And is Rob, is there a way to have a drop down menu for that? For like, the ref, for the source for the tags, I get. Is there a drop down menu for the tags? Not not currently, no. Okay. Um, because it's so designed may, it's designed to be fluid, right? Gotcha, gotcha. So Doug, you may want to have like a, a list of exactly how you want them entered in. Otherwise, you're going to end up with Rob Stanley, yeah. Robert Stanley, Rob. You, you know, like yeah. I think I think there is a drop down list in the excuse me in the tag. So I, I think, I think, so if I put like John Smith in there, that name will come down. Yeah. So like, I'll show you on my yeah, screen. Yeah. So if you like, can get them to using the same tag for the same person rather than creating a new one. I just know that's been yeah. a nightmare for us in keep. Yeah. I could see. Yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. you can see right here, I typed in tags, I typed Rob, Robert Stanley comes up. Okay. Right. But if it's, but there is no Rob. So I've got a little plus icon there. Right. Um, Gosh, I wish we, we could eliminate all human error, but unfortunately that's just <laughs> that's just part of the game um, to the extent that we can minimize that, of course. Like, so one of the things we can do in, in, in that's the opposite of that is I could say, if I tag as, um, you know, referral on here, instead of me filling out the source, if I tag this person as referral, referral sale right there, right? So if I tag referral sale, I can set this up to automatically change the source to referral. But the the opposite of that is not not quite as easy. I think you to know. answer your question, what I've done in the past is I will, if I see that there's, you can, um, there's a way to look at all your tags, all tags that are in, in use. And then I will kind of review those. And if there's any funny spellings or duplicates with like, um, just that they're, they're wrong, they should be something else. Then I yes. will go into contact and then I'll, I will look for those specific tags. I will change them and then I, I'll delete that tag and, and I'll be done with that. That's one way that I've been able to fix human errors like that, that, that uh, I'll put email newsletter and I, don't, I press enter and I forget to finish typing out the word and I get, I get enter, ha enter trigger happy and I just you know forget to finish spelling or just spelled it wrong. So that, that's one thing that's worked for me. Yeah, so what she's referring to is under the settings section here, you can go in and see the tags. This is a good example, actually, where I have the tag called lead twice. One of them has a space behind the word and one doesn't, but they're the same one. So I could go over here and delete this, but probably what I wanna do, what Tanya was saying, is I wanna go back to my contacts first and look for lead, right? and then make sure that everybody has the lead tag. This is a bad example because it's not a typo or whatever. Typically what happens, it's a typo, right? It's LED or LAED or something like that. And so you're gonna add the tag to the bad ones. Like let's say, oh, okay, I need to add Robert Stanley to this. So I'm just gonna hit add tag and I'm gonna add Robert, right? Some bogus stuff in there, but so I'm gonna add Robert to that person and so bob test now has the robert stanley tag if i research him again so there's ways to do that but yeah i mean the tags can get messy um you kind of need you kind of need it's it's education right so this is a a big driver in us doing this on a monthly basis is so you and or your team members can come here ask questions go through training and we're gonna this video for example recording the zoom meeting it's going to be posted on our YouTube channel and in our Facebook page, which by the way, if you haven't liked our new Cogent Marketing Facebook page, please do that. I think it's Cogent, is it Cogent Digital Marketing? I don't think Cogent Marketing was available. So it's like Cogent Digital Marketing. It's like Cogent that page. Digital Agency. Oh, Digital C. I don't even know what it is. That's how sharp I am. So the, uh, I would just say like, you know, just be on our YouTube channel and that stuff. So if you're not on these calls, you can have recordings and then even after this call, we're going to send out a link and an email to the recording. So you'll, you and your team will have access to it. Um, I will probably get this transcribed and put it on the website as well, but um, 
Yeah, we're going to make a private Facebook group. If you guys want in, in, in to be added to that, let, let us know because that way you can just ask questions in there. And then essentially we'll have all that information in there as we move forward. And then additionally, you know, smart people like Tanya can help and Trisha can help answer questions for me when I'm, you know, at the beach or, you know, the Super Bowl or whatever. So I guess the question I have, you know, is the way things are working here for me is that I don't deal with cogent much. I, you know, Jacqueline here deals with cogent all the time. <coughs> and this has been very helpful because Jacqueline's been cluing into things that seem to make more sense. But is there some way that she can print out a report for me to tell me what the CRM is doing? Um, yeah. So right now we don't have printed reports. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> Richard Trish. says you need to inspect by report. <laughs> so, so the the uh, the long answer is is that we are working on some reporting stuff. Uh, the short answer is log into it, Patrick. Quit being lazy. The no the <laughs> if if we if you know what data you want out of the system, we can help assist your staff in you know pulling the data out so that you get that whenever you need it. And then, of course, look, man, schedule a call with us whenever you want. Sure. Uh, let us help you train your team and then, you know, make sure that she knows what you want out of the system so we can help train her on in terms of how to get it out of there. And then, you know, the long term answer, as I said before, is we'll have reporting. Um, Joe Jepson has uh, harassed me about it a little bit, and we've worked on some things that are based loosely on his Excel spreadsheet that makes my head spin, but yeah. I kind of like to see Joe's Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. I don't think you would. I think you'd be confused, but. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. <laughs> I'm sure Trisha would send you a sample. <laughs> but... I, I, I was half serious about that. So. <laughs> and it's it's Joe and Trisha's spreadsheet because oh, Trisha so created it to begin with. So it's with really Trisha's it. spreadsheet. But no, it's not... <laughs> he added all the pivot tables and stuff that I don't know how to make, but oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So if, so it's, if you have someone in the business managers group, we I show it fairly often as an example. So so we have geek number one and geek number two mm -hmm. and built the spreadsheet. You guys are just smarter than the average bears. Mm -hmm. That that is a fact. Don't at me. That's true. I just don't rely on the robots to do all of the reporting for me. I don't <laughs> trust, I should say, the robots to do the Oh, reporting. so you're a Ronald Reagan fan. Trust but verify. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. When does the business managers group meet? It is on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Central. And that's something that you can reach out to Brittany in Rich's office and she can get your office manager, business manager added. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so to, to that point, though, I, I think that, um, I don't know, Trisha, you could probably speak to this better than I can. Like you can report in great detail or you can go high level in terms of like, uh, you know, what information you want and need. Patrick, at, at this point, like the, the last discussion we had, like your biggest pain point is you need more leads, period, right? Correct. Once you have a lot of leads, then you need the level of detail that Trisha and uh, Joe are working on and Kylie and Matt are working on. Like they have a million lead sources. So um but it does start to help to start tracking them early early because yeah. when yeah. i started working for joe he was not tracking them and i started tracking them yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um and patrick there is uh the joe's eay little like website he created is still up and that's where i think he does have the pclc template um, and it's I promise to vote for Joe.com. <laughs> <laughs> I will I'll actually go look at that. But it does have it. I'm pretty, yeah, you can download the the basic uh, Excel stuff for it. Now I'm gonna have to create Sorry, Robert, a... I did not turn, <laughs> mean intend to turn this into like an ad for the business managers group. And no, no, it's totally fine. Like this is that's part of the point of this, right? So the so the concept behind this, the silly CRM is to help us report and track stuff, right? So this information is valuable for me as well, because as we move forward, we want to make sure that we're expanding uh, in a way that makes sense for the group um, and, you know, makes things sensible. So I like it. Although I'm going to get the 
I promise not to vote for Joe.com and put something <laughs> crude up there. Because <laughs> the EAY is coming up again. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I think stuff is due Monday. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. not getting anything. So I'm, I'm, I'm buying the I promise not to vote for Joe.com and printing a t-shirt and wearing it to the next event because Joe oh, likes to wear t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. i'll get a kick out of that he would he'd be mad at me and and laugh at the same time probably <laughs> all right so any other questions before we wrap this up i think it's been productive any any uh is this valuable we should keep doing this i, I yeah, assume this, this is valuable this is okay. valuable thank you thank you uh robert yeah. thank you very much for the training because it you know it was very helpful for Jacqueline today. I mean, we've just kind of been, we've just been kind of saying, okay, well, we're going to create opportunities and, and do leads. And then basically I'm doing a separate spreadsheet where Jacqueline's kind of coming to me and I'm generating these other sets of numbers and, you know, and, and, and so I kind of general, I have a more of a 50,000 point view of what the CRM does. She's more, hands-on with it and i think this has really helped her kind of connect a bunch of dots so this is very helpful so yeah that's good and i think that's true for most of the firms right the attorneys are busy doing other stuff and the you know other team members are doing the detail work so no we it, added direct mail so that's a new thing that's, that's something we're going to start doing yeah and then you know and tracking stuff like lead source roi and all that kind of thing i want to make sure that we're doing as much as we can to help you track your ROI on things. And let's face it, that's a big part of what Rich preaches. So, right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, unless there's any final notes, I think we're going to conclude the meeting and, and we'll do this again. And uh, next month, fourth uh, Thursday of the month, we will be also adding a marketing training uh, thing like this. But it will be a little bit more uh, free flowing and more related to like, you know, Facebook versus Google, what's changing in the industry, that kind of stuff that'll be coming up soon. So we'll be having essentially two meetings per month on uh, different topics. Hearts and hugs. And then, uh, then, yeah, that's it. And if you guys have feedback, input, ideas, whatever, we're open to it. We're, a, we're an open book right now. We're, we want to get as many people as we can into the system and using it. I think we have, Ali, what do we have? 20 firms right now in, in Cogent. So we have 20 law firms in Cogent. Our goal is to get to hundred. I don't know if we'll reach that by the end of the year, but we'd like to have hundred law firms in here. And you guys are a big part of that because a lot of the improvements and changes we're making are based on your input and your usage and some of the custom coding stuff that we're doing in terms of workflow and things like that. So uh, you're on the ground floor level here. So Appreciate you and appreciate your time. All right. All right, guys. I guess that's it for now. We'll we'll talk soon. Okay. Thanks, Robert. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Have you. a good day, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh,